Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Gilda Lerman Center's occasional book talks, uh, now done as podcast. Uh, we're live. Uh, I'm in New Haven, New York, and our special guest, uh, Ed Ayers, is in, I believe, Richmond. Uh, uh, not Charlottesville, Richmond, right? Okay. Right, I'm in Charlottesville. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. You're in Charlottesville. Okay, good. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're here tonight to, uh, primarily to discuss Ed Ayers' magnificent new book, uh, Southern Journey, The Migrations of the American South, 1790-2000. I'm going to hold it up here. And then as well, uh, there is our, our beautiful poster made by Melissa McGrath uh, about uh, tonight's event. I want to introduce Ed uh, uh, as an old friend and a fellow historian. Uh, this is indeed an honor. I hope everyone out there grasps this. Uh, Ed Ayers is without question one of the most important American historians, certainly of, of my generation. And he's without question to me one of the most inventive or innovative historians uh, I've ever known. Um, I, I want to keep the introduction relatively short, but let's, uh, let's do him proper due. Uh, he did his B.A. at the University of Tennessee and his Ph.D. right here at Yale under uh, David Brian Davis in 1980. Uh, he has taught at and been Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia. He was then president of the University of Richmond. He is now president emeritus at the University of Richmond, as well as holds a professorship in the humanities. Through this extraordinary uh, career of educational leadership, deaning and being president and all the rest, not to mention president of the Organization of American Historians just a few years ago, Ed has nevertheless never ceased to produce a, a, as a historian at a rate uh, the rest of us basically envy. Um, he, uh, he has published a number of books. I'm just going to list a few of them. Vengeance and Justice, which is, I think, his first book about crime and punishment in the American South. The Promise of the New South, which was no less than a great, uh, huge attempt at uh, a revision of C. Van Woodward's uh, The Origins of the New South. In fact, a, a great book. Um, then he published the two volume history that came out of the Valley of the Shadow digital project. Uh, the first entitled In the Presence of Mine Enemies, the second, The Thin Light of Freedom. Uh, that, that dual uh, book project uh, is uh, in some ways one of a kind about the American Civil War. Uh, he did a little book of essays called What Caused the Civil War, which is from which I teach two or three of those essays in my lecture course. Uh, and now here we have uh, Southern Journeys, uh, the migrations of, of the American South. Along the way, he's won all kinds of book prizes. He's won the Lincoln Prize, the Bancroft Prize. He was a finalist for the National Book Award, a finalist for the Pulitzer uh and and so on so in effect he's won every book prize you can win um he's also received uh, a great honor the national humanities medal uh from president obama at the white house um so um ed this is very special when i saw your uh, the no the notice of your new book which I might have been on Twitter, I can't remember. <laughs> I just seized on it and said, we got to do this. So Ed Ayers, welcome back to the GLC and uh, sort of welcome back to New Haven. Yeah, thanks very much, David. I, uh, oh, we lost you, Ed, you got muted. Oh dear. But you, you can keep going if you like, that was fun. You did, but uh, <laughs> I'll turn it off. And there you go. Now, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're good. You're okay. Good. Many people wish they could find the mute button for me, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's not always easy to find. Thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here, David. You bet. You know, I left one thing out, and it may come up as you discuss this, this huge mapping project. Ed has also been one of the major players in, in the public history of the Civil War era 
and reconstruction, but, but particularly the public history of the city of Richmond. For a long time, he was chairman of the board of the National Civil War Center in Richmond, where I used to serve on the board too, but because I missed so many meetings, uh, Ed threw me off. So, or they threw me off, which was, which was a good <laughs> move. Right? Waiting for you right there, David. Yeah, that was a good move on their part. Anyway, <laughs> uh, now, okay, Ed, I, I, wanna, I wanna start by just asking you a very big question. All right. Um, and then we will get to some of these maps and you're gonna, you're gonna take the screen over. Uh, you've written social histories. You did this deep military social history dive into uh, the valley there in Virginia up to Pennsylvania. Uh, you've done books on Southern storytelling. You, you did the great work on the New South, um, which was all kinds of history if we think about it. What now landed you on this idea, this big, big idea of migrations? Was it just that it's so obvious, <laughs> an important part of, of Southern history, or, or do you have a sense of how you ended up on this particular topic? You would think that I would, but I'm not exactly sure how I got there. I mean, it had a, a very proximate cause. Uh, I was invited to give the Fleming lectures at LSU. Right. And this was the year after I had uh, finished the presidency, uh, after eight years at Richmond, and that I had just put out Thin Light of Freedom. So the well was a, a little dry, uh, you know, and I, I didn't really want to have anything else to say about the American Civil War. And I've always thought, you know, it would be great to write a short book, uh, which I, I tend not to do. You and I seem to have that tendency together. Um, and, uh, but in all honesty, it was triggered by my friends um, at the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond. Yeah. And they made, and we'll look at some of these things later perhaps, they made a map of the forced migration of enslaved people and they, in, invented this new technique that we'll look at here in a minute that you can tell in smaller than county level where people are leaving and where people are going. And they mapped all of, for, for, um, all of forced, my, uh, forced migration of slavery. And you could toggle back and forth between a, a... No, you got muted again, Ed, darn it. Why did that happen? Hmm narratives. This, this, am I back? You're back. You're back. Okay. Yeah. So just tell me that and I'll, I'll remember. Okay. So, um, and I saw this map that they had shown uh, areas where people are leaving, where people are going. And I thought, you know, could we do that for all of Southern history? Can we go all, can we uh, look at the Great Migration and can we look at the contemporary South? I think if you look at, you know, say Promise of the New South and what it is I'm trying to do it set the South in motion. You know, our stories about the South tend to freeze it in place. You know, you look at a text, yeah. you, know, you look at a textbook about slavery, it's the same picture, it's a separate chapter. We'll take a quote from 1818 yeah. and 1858, like nothing changed in between. But, the, yeah. and we'll also, people will talk about sharecropping, like nothing happened, right? <laughs> After emancipation mm. till the great migration. And so I used mm -hmm. to, when I was out on the, on the uh, lecture circuit for Promise in the New South, I said, who can tell me anything that happened in the South between the end of Reconstruction and World War II? And you'd see <laughs> people kind of look up. And they'd say, well, W.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington disagreed with each other. That's something you yeah, have yeah, in all yeah. our textbooks, right? Um, it was poor. And I said, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened in the American South except the largest political revolt in American history, the invention of the most right. popular trademark in the world in Coca-Cola, the invention of the most rapidly <laughs> spreading religion in the world of Pentecostalism, uh, and uh, the invention of America's only true contributions to world culture of country blues and jazz music. Other than that, <laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> yeah, static. And so, and, static and so place. Like, exactly. And, we still kind of think that when you read representations of the South, you know, it's yeah. people sitting on the front porch in front of the general store. Right. Or whatever. So it's a part of, you know, people may be able to tell from my accent, I'm from the South, I'm from Tennessee. <laughs> and um, I didn't know that until I went to Yale and people suddenly pointed out that I <laughs> talk funny. 
Yeah. I had an ethnicity for the first time in my life. That was fun. Uh, but uh, anyway, so the, the idea- And you're from East Tennessee, that matters, right? It does. I'm from the only congressional district that's voted Republican since 1865 to the present. Oh my God. In the South, right? And wow. I went to Andrew Johnson Elementary School. <laughs> oh Lord, well you had, a lot to, you had a lot to overcome. Well, I don't know about that. But anyway, the point being, I thought that by using this one method that we could see from 1790 to the present, We'd yeah. be able to see, I, I, I think of this, these maps as like a tracer die that uh -huh. shows that all that's going on in the South. So that's yeah. where the idea came from. One more attempt to see if I can't sort of thaw. Yeah. Well, you're right. That means the image of the South, uh, particularly for so many people who remain in the North or the West for most of their lives. Our is understanding. That, yeah, a, a region that stays the same. Uh, exactly. Uh, it, it did not. Uh, or a region that was always kind of, kind of pre-modern and, and behind. Exactly. Uh, yeah. and, and, and you can't explain anything about the South if you think that, including slavery. Yeah, oh yeah. No, those people were, uh, they knew their markets. <laughs> well, and you think about the, what, what we show here in the maps on, on, on uh, the slave era, an area the size of continental Europe populated in 50 years. Yeah. The largest system of slavery in the modern world. Yeah. And I, we really wrapped our minds around that. And just one other answer about what I was trying to do. Within mm -hmm. one book, we have white, black, indigenous, and immigrant people. Right. Oh, and yeah. we to separate all those people out in all American history. Here's our chance to put them together. In fact, one of the great features of this book, and I want to say this particularly for the teachers out there, uh, and by the way, uh, we, we are pitching this especially to teachers tonight. And I forgot to mention, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A, not into the chat. Uh, I will be examining the Q&A later and, and asking Ed lots of questions. But it, one of the great features of the book is, not, is the maps, but not just the maps. It's your demographics. It's your numbers. If people are curious about Indian removal, I mean, who, who were all these people? Where did they come from? Where did they go? You also have the numbers. And if people are curious about this vast thing called the domestic slave trade, which just transformed American history, not just Southern history, you have pretty good numbers on that too. I mean, you have numbers on everything. And, and that is such teachable stuff uh, uh, in, in the way you pre I wanna ask you one other kind of big, broad question. You can just bat this away. It's kind of historiographical. I wonder if you're aware of, you know, big old influences like uh, Fernand Braudel and the, you know, the old Annals school. Now, for a lot of people out there listening, they may not know what that is, but Braudel and others, those French historians, they, they perfected this idea of studying whole regions of the world over centuries. Uh, you know, and everything about the region. Uh, I wonder if you're, if you've been quite aware of that, or you just kind of, um, it just sort of filtered into the way you saw the world historically over 40 years. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm still taken aback by 40 years, but that is, well, well, you know, a couple decades then, whatever. Well, it is 40 years, exactly. Uh, you know, yes, uh, I remember reading. Uh, Montaigu, that, that's actually where the Valley of the Shadow came from. Uh-huh, right, right. Uh, you got muted again. I don't know why that's happening. Shoot. Daniel, can we improve the audio here at all? I don't know. Is it my, am I back? Am I back? No. You're back. Go. So, yeah. this is we'll push through. Everybody just needs to assume if I go silent, it was brilliant what I said. Just fill in the blank with something. We'll take notes on the silence. <laughs> so here's what here's what I believe I'm doing, David. I'm setting the null school in motion. Uh huh. So okay. so what is it that is the different the challenge of history? How do you show depth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and motion? Right. Yeah. Our, our language isn't good enough for it. We have meanwhile. Yeah, we, that's right. That's we, right. We can't do simultaneity. 
But as you see in these maps, yeah. I'm showing you millions of people doing things simultaneously, right? Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned the Valley of the Shadow, which is going to be 30 years old next year. When Whoa. I first imagined that, but it's before the web that was came. The first out. history website most of us ever kind of looked at, actually. Yeah, I know. And I was probably and, a decade and, and, behind. And, <laughs> well, it, it was you didn't miss anything the first few years. It was pretty awkward. <laughs> but the idea there is let's let everybody see the depth of history for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Here, mm -hmm. you figure out how do you tell a story out of the census records, right? Or here, here is a, these, and so that it was participatory. The, the thing is, when we did the Valley of the Shadow, we had to build it so you could see it over the equivalent, over the equivalent, any, uh, the worst phone anybody on this call, <laughs> this webinar has, right? 2,400 baud modems, right? So it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Now we're carrying around supercomputers where you can visualize comp complex patterns. Mm. So in many ways, this project and the New American History Project I wanna show is to leverage the major advantage of our own time, which is all this, just a surplus of computing power, right. generally, which we're kind of wasting, <laughs> you know, to yeah. send PDFs to each other or that. Yeah. And so the idea would be, wouldn't it be great? I don't know about you, but when I, you know, after 40 years of studying history, I can say 1873. Mm -hmm. And I don't picture every book I've written, I've read about 1873. I can kind of picture a map of America in yeah. my head. What's yeah. going on, the labor things, the I thought, wouldn't it be great if students could see that first instead of yeah. making read ten thousand books? Right. Show them the patterns. So, well, I, I, I'm excited to show you about them. So that's where it comes from. It is when I was there at Yale, seventy-five to eighty. It was the birth of social history. Right. And I knew I wanted to do that. Right. But we've not been able to find a way to put social history in motion. And that's, right. what, that's what this project's about. And social history and the good narrative, which you have accomplished. There are others who have too, but, but you know, that was the problem of social history. Sometimes it just forgot that there was any story, yeah. uh, but you never forgot that. All right, well, let's go, let's go to the goods here. You divide this book into three big parts. I'm going to go to... Sorry? Oh, you muted again, Ed. Rev it up again. Yeah, let's go to the maps. Okay. Okay. You have me and oh, yeah. the maps. Yeah, we got you. Uh, okay. And unfortunately, I'm on till still. I don't know why, but I am. But we got the maps. Yeah, Layla, it looks great. So what you're seeing here is uh, at dsl.richmond.edu. I know nobody will go to it until we're finished talking. Uh, everybody will wait and hear all this, the funny things that we're saying to each other, David. But okay. uh, the, what the, the, the site does not have are all the words right. And I want to be sure that people understand there's a book <laughs> that we're going to talk about that has all these words in it. And LSU did this beautiful job with these full scale maps and all the words. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, and it feels good. It's really nice. But at we're good looking price just too. at the maps tonight. For a book like that, it, yeah, it actually it is. has a good price. So just well, LSU worked really hard to make it possible for it. To, you're right. So let me explain how these maps work, David. And then because once you understand one, they're all clear. Mm -hmm. So areas that are blue are, are areas where the population is, is declining. Mm -hmm. And the brighter the blue, the greater the decline. Mm -hmm. Places that are varied shades of brown is where the population is increasing. So mm -hmm. I could ask you, just as an exercise here, David, what are we seeing here? And you would say, well, look, we're seeing the depopulation of the tidewater of Virginia and North Carolina and of some parts of Appalachia to fill in the South Carolina Piedmont and the bluegrass of That's Kentucky. exactly what I would have said, yes. <laughs> and you would be right. So, so now we'll go on and we'll, we'll look at the black population change for the same years. Mm -hmm. What strikes you about the comparison of those two, David? Well, we've got a large black population moving across the Appalachians to, to Kentucky, as well as Tennessee, and uh, west out of the, the Carolinas and Georgia. That's right. And so you can see, look how much more concentrated black population movement is, right? Yeah. They are being taken 
to right. exactly where they need it. So, so you, we can go this basically watch this. Right. Settling of the South. And I'm going to show, so there's black population change, 1810 to 20. Here you can see uh, the area around Nashville where Andrew Jackson is getting established here. You can also see the beginnings mm -hmm. of the Cotton Kingdom along the Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, and Baton Rouge, right. but also sugar. See how that's kind of glowing there? Now you switch over, and there's the white population right. in the same year. You see they are not going to where African-American people are being taken, right? You're seeing yeah. white flight in the very first years of the slave trade, right? Why? It's because if enslaved people are being taken there, the land is too expensive for poor white people to buy, right? right? So, so the these are big planters. These are, these are landowners, big planters, taking as many as 20 to 50 slaves with them. Exactly, right? So you're going to start seeing uh, these patterns diverge. Now look at this. Here we're seeing, uh, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, and what I'm getting ready to show you is um, the way that the history of indigenous people interacts. This is all blurred out, that, folks. It's not. This is not your uh, your computer. This is it's still loading. Okay, so look at this. Yes, it's going to take a little while to load. So uh, what? No, I'm always. The, the excitement of digital history is that we're still in the early years of it. I'll, I'll return to that. There's a really great map that shows you the sessions of, of the native lands that year by year. You can actually watch, uh, I'm gonna give it one more chance to load. You can actually watch as uh, the, the land sort of is taken away one piece at a time. We think about Indian removal but it right. turns out that it's not this thing that we shoehorn into two pages in the textbook, right? Where, where right. you have all that. So apparently it's, it's, it's gonna take a while to do that. Here's what I wanna show too. This is after the native populations have been removed. Look at how rapidly, now here's the thing. People think of the old South. I'll yeah. point out the South was about as old at the time of the Civil War as a subdivision is today. Right, it's <laughs> it's right. brand new. This is only, this is only twenty years before the war, and then and this population ten years before was inhabited by people who'd lived there for hundreds of years. And, and, they, and the cotton belt right. is all already well established, right? So exactly. There you see it across the south. And but look how the upper south is just bleeding population. Yeah, yeah. Right. So and and this shows you where those people were in the course of the. Um, right. Of the, and so you know, Ed, in, in, your you text, in your text, when you do Indian removal and the indigenous populations moving, you show that it's pressures on, the, on their land that has gone on for quite some time. It isn't just, you know, a federal enactment in 1830 that brings, or a President Jackson that brings about Indian removal. It's this tremendous pressure on getting their land. You can actually see the, pop the white population in particular is just backed up right at the border, just ready to go as soon as they get it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's an advantage of seeing white, black, and indigenous history in the same frame, which we usually yeah. separate out different stories, and yeah. they're all the same. So, uh, so that's, uh, and then I, I also show uh, that uh, this is a pretty cool map here. Uh, oh, yeah, the there's white population. So now you have full full bore, 1840 to 1860. But I want to show um, foreign-born population. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. It, it didn't you know? Uh, it didn't yeah. But, but this is a powerful one. And I, I hope you agree with my interpretation of this since I've written it in a book. What we see here is that areas that are varying shades of yellow or brown are areas where there's a predominance of male enslaved people. There you go. And we're not surprised that there's a predominance of them in the sugar districts because right. there the slave traders are buying 90% of the people they buy are male. Right. And the women they buy tend to be teenagers who can bear children for as long as possible. And the same thing is true along the Mississippi Delta, but trying to figure out why Virginia is majority male 
and it's enslaved population. I think it's because of all these areas that are majority female, because if you are a white slave owner and only own one or two enslaved people, as most do, mm -hmm. you buy a woman first. Right. So there's a predominance of women mm. and they're on their own. And the men in Upper South are basically left behind because they're less desirable uh, as a product. So, and then we try to show how the clearest determinant we can find of, seg of uh, secession is areas where white men have moved recently. Uh, yeah. So anyway, those are various things, just the old South, <laughs> you can see oh, how yeah. dynamic it is. So but can I also point out, just so the reader, I mean, our, our, our audience understands, yeah. <clears throat> these maps are accompanied with a beautiful narrative that doesn't just talk about statistics. You talk about the nature of that domestic slave trade, the nature of that labor in the sugar districts, the nature of that labor, uh, say, up the Mississippi Delta, the, the huge cotton growing region. And you also talk about, <clears throat> it isn't just demographics, you show why Mississippi became the richest single place in the United States with more millionaires, how Natchez became this amazing, Natchez was a weirdly a kind of Silicon Valley for two decades, right? That's, I wish I'd thought of that. That's a great phrase. Well, I don't know. I mean, it just is this center of wealth uh, that is beyond the dreams of, of most New York bankers. Yeah, and I, you know, and when people look at the book, they'll see that I'll write one paragraph and have 10 books in the notes because yeah yeah you're of going off a lot of stuff <laughs> yeah because i'm trying to say well if i've got one or two paragraphs to talk about you know uh that flow of capital into it you know there's you know the flood of books in the last decade about all that what do i say about it so you're right i i did try to say if you just read the the pay, the written words it'd be kind of a history of the south is what i was trying to do Right. Shall we go over to the next chapter and, and see what's happened? Sure, as long as we don't skip the Civil War too quickly, but go oh, ahead. Well, <laughs> so, but we won't skip it at all. Uh, this oh, is right. yeah. a, a cool map, I think. And let me say, maybe very Oh, that, I love that map. I mean, it yeah. shows you, well, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, people can now see, I talked about my colleagues at the Digital Scholarship Lab. Let me be yeah. sure that I name them again, if I didn't name them before. Justin Madrin, who is the GIS specialist, and Nathaniel Ayers, who is a designer. And basically- some relation to you, I think. I believe he might be my son, which right. I'm very proud. And so I went to him and I said, hey, I don't know how to do any of this, but wouldn't it be cool if we made a hundred maps by which I mean, you make a hundred maps that I ask? And they, they were great about it. So this is a heat map showing areas where United States troops came into contact with African-Americans. Um, and you can see uh, the Sea Islands, Virginia, but also areas that uh, along the, the Delta. But you can also see how the Confederacy held out so long. Yeah. <laughs> Look at these areas that, and then we, we know the camps and you know, people understand where those were. Uh, but one of the things that you'll see here is that black population change. Look at how people left wherever there had been union occupation, David. Right. 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 Th th those maps overlap. And so it's like, but also look where black people move. They move to the black belt. Yeah. Why? First of all, the North will not welcome them. Secondly, if you're a farmer and you're going to share the crop, you want to share the crop where there's something to share. You want to go to where the land is rich, right? And so people are abandoning the upper South. Uh, here I, I show all the growth of towns, show how much more cotton the South grew in 1900 than it did in 1860. Can you stop on that uh, for a minute because that's one of those classic images of the South, you know, that the cotton kingdom kind of all fell apart or something. No, there's more cotton production by 1900 than there was before the war. Yeah, so, and, so there is 1900, the cows expanded. That's what it was in 1860. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. And so you're exactly right. And and it's also more intense. And, and so, you know, uh, Georgia Piedmont, South Carolina Piedmont, areas that had been abandoned before is worn out. Why right. are they growing now? Because right. now they have guano. They bring in bat manure and they're able to extend the growing season and do it right. and, and look at the scale of Texas. And so, again, the sharecropping was not just something where 
you know, a former slave just stayed on the land, got a cabin, worked 40 acres. There's a lot of movement going around, going on all over the South. People are just looking for a chance. Well, what's amazing is that, you know, uh, the, the black population of the South might be the most mobile population in the United States during yeah. sharecropping. Uh, yeah. And yeah. again, which just directly contradicts our understanding. Right. Now, okay, what, what are we looking at right here, David? I'm gonna keep doing this to you. Just okay. Just... Uh, oh, this is the Great Migration. Yeah, which looks oh, nothing yeah. like our textbooks, right? Which oh, have a big red arrow. Well, the textbooks well, usually just have some arrows. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So what we're seeing here- Look at all that blue region, whoa. Yeah, but you see, not all of the blue region. So why is this? This is the place, so it's World War I, cotton prices spike, right? Okay. If you can move to an area where uh, the, uh, where, where they're in high production of cotton, you can make a lot of money as a sharecropper uh, for that year, right? Mm -hmm. And so you might say, well, you know, some of our friends have moved to Chicago or Detroit or Cleveland or Pittsburgh, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Kansas City. Uh, mm -hmm. And we might follow them, but right now I think I'm going to Birmingham. Yeah. Right? Or I'm right. going to go where, where there's some chance, or I'm going to go to right across the river into Arkansas where there's good cotton crops, or I might go to the Piedmont of the Carolinas where right. towns are starting to grow. We're not allowed to work in the cotton textile mills, which are here now, but there are other jobs being along the way. So mm. I think what this shows is that uh, the Great Migration is several migrations at the same time, right? Yeah. And as you said, it's black people looking for where can we build lives for ourselves? Look at the cities of Texas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and people know about the Tulsa, right? 1921, the yeah. massacre. Well, that's because people have moved there from the South to, to create new lives for themselves. So I like this. And it also shows you why today sort of a euphemism for black is urban, <laughs> you know, yeah. urban radio. <laughs> yeah. It's because the Great Migration really was extraordinarily targeted toward these cities where jobs were, right? Well, in fact, uh, you know, as, as anyone in, well, not anyone, but a lot of people in Chicago will tell you and historians of Chicago will tell you that the west side of Chicago was settled by black folk from basically Louisiana, Mississippi, whereas the south side more from a little further east, you know, there the are real patterns to that. But you know what your book also shows, Ed, that the migration was also a white migration. You well, know. it's funny you say that because I just called up that map to show I that. Know. Oh, I'm sorry. Matter of fact. But, but um, no, no, I'm, how I'm, the white people come north too. I mean, that's, anyway. Yeah, look at that. More, yeah, there you are. more white people than white people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a small percentage, but it's more people, yeah. right? And so you can also start to see, and you can also see how they're just, a, they're abandoning the black belt too, right? Oh yeah, they're and going to they're moving to, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or they're going to the industrial belt of the North, right? Yeah. So that's the important thing too. Again, putting white and black stories together is, reveals things that we don't see otherwise. And you know, this not is to- my, my, this is one of my favorite maps because we forget about this part of it. Uh, white folk came north to work in the factories too. And I have to tell you, I grew up in a section of Flint, Michigan, where our neighborhood was known as Little Arkansas. Wow. I wow. mean, yeah, well, now my, this, my that street was full of people from Arkansas. <laughs> and that street yeah. was full of people from Mississippi and Arkansas. <laughs> Yeah, well, my family's right here in North Carolina and Tennessee, and mm -hmm. that was called the Hillbilly Highway. Yeah, that's from right. there to Detroit. That's right. And so uh, my family talks about going to Detroit, and that was kind of Detroit. the place yeah. where you get. Well, some of them came up to Flint, where I grew up. That was exactly. also known as Dixie Highway, which was a real highway. But anyway. Right. So, but I think that that's a, you know, as we think about teachers who are with us tonight, um, my dream is is that the Great Migration will become something more when people can see yeah. all that it was, right? Uh, that's something else we've reduced to just a few images, right? And we imagine it's all people moving from Mississippi to Chicago. And yeah. instead, it's much greater than that. So, you know, but look, I'm gonna show you too how it continues. Look at the 1920s. Yeah, 
Yeah. It's all urban and the South is, is pretty much fixed. White people continue to get the heck out of Dodge. Look at yep. Chicago, yeah. New York, right? East Coast, uh, yeah. And the 30s, they stop, but there's too, black population change. Look at that in the 1930s. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So then I want to switch over to the, the most recent uh, chapter, which goes from, if it's okay. Sure, go ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. So this is a different, so this is, this is black population 40 to 50. You recognize this is the same pattern unbroken from the 19 teens, except far more intensive. There are World more War people, yeah. yep, more moving out of the South in World War II than in World War yeah. I yeah. and across a broader area, okay? So with clicking on this, you go forward to 1950s, okay? Same thing, 1960s, mm. and look there, Mississippi. Wow. But yeah. watch this. In the 1970s, the migration begins to reverse. Right. Right. Goes and the other way. Reversing too. And look at Atlanta. Right. We'll talk a little, a little bit later about Atlanta. In but Miami. also all these cities here, but also yeah. Florida and Texas. So this is by separating out black people and white people, we get a clear sense of, you know, as we say, the agency that they, they are choosing yeah. where yeah, to yeah. go. Yeah. Um, and Time is when the Rust Belt is invented, right? Uh, the phrase, and yeah. people beginning to. So then you go down and you can see white population change, and forty to fifty. God, yeah. Look at look at Appalachia. Yeah. Right. There's a huge migration out of Appalachia. That's and right. Appalachia, as those of us who are from there say. I'm David. sorry. Sorry about that. All right. All right. Uh, and also for Arkansas, you're talking about Flint. Look at that. Yeah. 50s where they're going there they are and, and then 70s look at that that's the return migration of white settlers or the, the migration of white settlers but look at this you will recognize this pattern the black belt that was first formed 150 years before right. is still defining the patterns of migration white people are again flooding to the you see how large the suburbs are around atlanta and yeah. houston Dallas, yeah. obviously Florida is booming, but how the enduring uh, patterns, but you can also start seeing how the cities of the North are losing population. Oh yeah. Right. So that's one of the things about this. There's even, it's about the migrations of the American South, but from 1900 on, it has maps of the whole United States. And so yeah. that you can see where people are going, right? So uh, I kind of like this map of the interstate highway system that you can watch it emerge of several of these maps it shows yeah. the evolution of the highway system which defines in many ways where the population of the south lives today yeah, now, this yeah. is pretty amazing to people look at this so this is popular this is migration of people from latin america so this uh -huh. is 1990 to 2000 you can see they're moving to where you expect florida texas yeah. and the piedmont yeah that's 2000 yeah. to 2010 oh my god the the, the growth of uh immigration yeah. from Latin America. And you can see that this is, it's not only urban. Turns out that a lot of the places that are most receptive to people from Latin America are rural areas. And people right. will think about chicken, chicken processing and things like this, that right. th there's an actual place where um, there, um, the opportunities lie, right? Yeah, well, the towns that need an in-migration because they're desperate for labor. That's right. And that so, happened in the Midwest, too. Exactly. And we tend to think of the South as being inhospitable to immigrants, but you can see here that the South has had at least a quarter of all people from Latin America have moved to the yeah. South, not just Texas and Florida. It's a different story with people from various parts of Asia. Here, that's early. Today, you can see it's almost entirely urban. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. But we also see people like Nikki Haley, Bobby Jindal, or yeah. are, are coming uh, oh, yeah. out of that as well. Hmm. So I'm going to scroll down this part to show things that the enduring power of this migration. So this is still now uh, wow. from 80 to 90, the black population. Look how it's still basically, you would be surprised there's still people left in the black belt, but there are. <laughs> but they are moving to the cities. Yes, uh, suburbs and cities. And so if we take the overview now, we tend to forget that 
the, the South is the place where one well, the fastest growing parts of the United States. We're used to Florida, you can see it growing rapidly yeah. in Texas, but the whole upper South, you know, so Nashville and Raleigh and, and yeah. Richmond uh, are, are all cool now in Atlanta, right? And right. so for the first time in American history, net migration of black people to the South. Right. And it's also the case that the, the South is a magnet for national and international migration. Yeah. This is pretty interesting. If you ask people to self, who self-identify as various native peoples, right. the same areas that they were driven from, the Seminoles, Lumbee, North Carolina, right. Creek people driven out of Alabama, Georgia, mm -hmm. Choctaw. Wow. And so what exactly does this tell us? You know, I gave a talk to um, some um, native leaders and um, mm -hmm. th they, it's great that the very areas that they were driven from are places that they have now kind of reclaimed. But it's yeah. also the case that starting in this, this census, if you are identified as white or black, you can also claim American Indian ancestry. Uh -huh. And so that more people want to be Cherokee or Choctaw than did 40 years ago. So yeah. not only is the population fluid, but definitions of population are right. fluid, right? Right. So people, uh, yes. people will recognize blue. this pattern. Yes. That's right. And so this is 2016, but it's almost exactly the same as 2020. Uh, yeah. That is extraordinarily similar. But here's what I, and what, we can talk about that, but I wanted to show this. So we, we finished this book in the summer of, last summer. Right. And LSU said, I, I wrote and said, can we put maps of the COVID crisis in there? And yeah. they said, yes. So they held up production and Justin and Nate wow. made yeah. these maps. So, but this is what we already had in there. So what you see in 2016, huh. the results of the migration of the late 18th and early 20th, 19th century. But you see two patterns, the areas that have the largest proportion of black population, but the areas that have the largest proportion of white population yeah. are the places with poor health, right? Yeah. It's also the places with family income below poverty level. Now, people have seen enough of these maps to guess what's going on here. Yeah, It's the depopulation itself that is making these places poor and having very few resources to help take care of themselves. So Appalachia has been a massive outmigration from yeah. West Virginia, uh, but also massive outmigration we've seen for generation after generation. So what this means is if you're an older person, you don't really have a tax base to help support hospitals and so forth. Uh, so what that means is that this is spring of 2020. We know about COVID in New York City, but yeah. the places that it hits most first yeah, are the are. black belt of that. And then this is the last map we were able to make. You can see yeah. COVID in our own year bears the mark of the population movements that we see. No, they're Indian reservations, aren't they? In New yes, Mexico, that's right. right. That's the Navajo that's, uh, yeah. and, other, and others. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So if you, know, if you look at the New York Times today, uh, you'll still see that as of today, the states with the most rapidly increasing COVID right. infection rates are uh, Florida, Texas, Georgia, Virginia, uh, in the mm -hmm. South. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then I think maybe the tweet that you saw, David, uh, mm -hmm. was pointing out that in the election of we just had, that if you want to figure out why the Democrats now control Congress, and in some ways why Joseph Biden is president, Right. This migration. First of all, it was Southern Black people in South Carolina who, right. remember, who determined that Joe Biden was the one who could win, right? Yeah. We also know that it was Black people who voted uh, for the Democrats in, in most concentrated numbers who won. But we also know that it's this migration of Black and white and immigrant people to the cities of Georgia that yeah. in the last 30 years that changed mm -hmm. things. But here's the thing, more African-Americans have moved to the suburbs since the 1970s than moved in the Great Migration. Good Lord. Wow. Right? Yeah. So if you know that, and you can see the suburban vote and the black vote, yeah. I, I think 87% of the black people who live in Atlanta actually live in suburbs. 
Yeah. So you see yeah. how these demographic patterns uh, have great pressure. So that's kind of a breathless overview. Oh, of two that's amazing. Well, can I just point out that th this is breathless because th the book is organized in three big chapters, which uh, you know are the antebellum 1790, 1860, and 1860 to uh, 1940. 1940, uh, and then 1940 all the way to 2020. Um, and but but what you've done, I must say, and I, I want to ask a couple of questions about this. What you've done is also provided a narrative with this, such that if you get this book, folks, or if you go to the website, uh, it isn't just maps. Uh, it is a narrative that tells us why this is happening, the scale of which it's happening, with anecdotes about real people with real names uh, and real experiences. But it, what it shows at the end of the day is that the South and therefore the nation because of all these out migrations and then return migrations uh, is a story of constant movement. And you know, I was reminded, I don't remember if you quoted him, I don't think you did, but uh, Alexis de Tocqueville has this line in his famous democracy in America. He was just astonished when he, came to the US in 1831, but, but he said this about Northerners. He said, these crazy America, he didn't use the word crazy, but he said, these, these Americans, they're constantly moving. And then they, they build themselves a dwelling and then they move again before the roof is on. Yep. He was talking about all these, these, this Yankee migration across to the Midwest. It's absolutely true of the South too. It, and, and he got that, I think, once he once he went there. But he didn't spend as much time in the South. No, he just he he barely he like a two week peak. I think. Wasn't but here's the thing. <laughs> Let's think about this. Because of slavery, yeah, the white South was able to claim as much territory as the North settled. Yes. Right? Yes. So a portable labor system that allowed a much smaller population with basically no immigrants to hold its own with the booming population of the North for decades, yeah. long enough to create the Civil War, right? And, yeah. and, and so the, you know, the South is unique in that it is this population that De Tocqueville described, which is, you know, settler society, right? right. But right. it's the settler slave society. Right. There's no other one like this in the world that right. is, and I think if, and this helps us explain indigenous history as well. So it makes you appreciate um, just how strange American history is. Yeah. I've gotten used to the idea. So you're right. I would say in, in the writing that I did, yeah. those of us who have been to the doctor know about uh, MRIs, right? It's <laughs> like, you know, I think of these maps as like I'm reading an x ray and trying to explain what it means. Uh -huh. now, the maps uh -huh. don't explain themselves. So if you go to the, this website, and we'll talk a little bit later what all the th cool things you can see on this site, yeah. uh, you can see these maps, but uh, and you can ask your students to explain what it means. I've tried to, to explain <laughs> what it is that they mean. But the maps are almost always used in our textbooks as illustrations of things we already know. Right. Instead, <laughs> these, are big, these are puzzles that the reader and I try to solve together. And right. sometimes, you know, it's, it's, um, it's anomalies like that in the Great Migration, why a lot of people were actually moving into Arkansas instead of going to Chicago. Right. And I try to explain why. It's because there were tractors uh, were being introduced in some places. It helps it explain all these kinds of things. So, mm -hmm. but you're right. But it, it is kind of to get our students thinking about history in new ways. This is to dislodge us, kind of shock us a little bit and think, well, what's, the, what's this? You know, another thing, but Ed, another thing one learns from your book is a great deal about uh, topography, geography, environment, soils. Uh, you know, look, uh, the slave society was going where the best soils were. You also have moments where you tell us why Texas you know, we always hear about how unique Texas is because of its size and all of this. But there's a there's a place where you say Texas is a distillation of Southern history, a virtual embodiment of the slave, the settler slave hybrid. 
Texas happened so fast. I mean, it just boomed, right? From you know, 1820s and 30s into this colossus of growth um, and became this kind of whole new society unto itself, uh, but very much a part of the cotton kingdom. And then you have other places where you talk about the uniqueness of Oklahoma in this story, not, and then not least the incredible fertility of the Mississippi Valley. This is a story about soils and labor. And you know, we, we, we know that race and slavery is this central thread of our history. <laughs> in case we didn't know that, we we're living another year of being reminded. But we can't just do that history without knowing something also about the economies that are forged out of these kinds of soils. And I also like the way you never let your reader forget, and I'd love to hear you comment on it, you never let your reader forget that slaves became this tool, this engine that drove this massive colossus machine that gave Southern, white Southern leaders by the 1850s a faith that this would last forever. Yeah. They're wrong about that, of course. Yeah. And if it hadn't moved, it wouldn't have lasted. No, that's right. Because Migration we, is its only breathing room. It's, it really does help. You know, we all know the Civil War's caused by fight over the territories, right? Yeah. But you understand that slavery for its lifeblood depends on expansion, not because it's exhausting the soils necessarily, because we start seeing Virginia and South Carolina coming back in the yeah. late antebellum period, right? They can recover, they start industrializing things. But what we do see is that the comparative advantage, if you, if you own 10 enslaved people and nothing else, and you're able to move to land that's never been farmed before, the money that you can make is just, but it can show you why the Republicans of the North were right. Yeah. You know, that this is an existential threat. The other thing it shows is how flexible slavery was oh, in yeah. the Civil War II. They didn't very have- Very adaptable, to. very adaptable. Yeah. I mean, today, what's the, the largest uh, cotton producing state? California. Yeah. <laughs> so it would suggest that that could have expanded that way. But th thanks for those, those kind of words. What else I you got? I got to ask you one other thing here because right. it really struck me. Uh, we're always trying to understand why is the South so conservative? You know, we, we, you know, all those maps that came out, the maps of the Confederacy and the maps of red states and all of that. And there's something to that. But there's a place on page 37 in your book. Yeah. Uh, I love this. Um, where you say, this is still in the first chapter on the antebellum period, you say, some white Southerners worried about the lack of social development, but many preferred, they said, their uncrowded, egalitarian, independent, low tax, low land price, unregulated rural society to the north. And then you go on, and I won't keep reading it, but you go on to show that this in effect is the roots of conservatism. Keep government out of my life, my land, my, my uh, political identity. Uh, I don't need it, I'll, I'll just move again. I'll just move again. I mean, I'm not saying this explains all conservatism, yeah. but no, but it, I didn't. There's the root there. Isn't it? <laughs> I found that fascinating because we, we, you know, we're always. It's the same thing in the West, in a way, you know. Don't, yeah, don't we, we the implemented, you know, by the experience, and we think that is the yeah the way things are supposed to be. And I still think today, if you'd ask many white Southerners, that's that's what they would say. That's what country music's about. Yeah proud to be this way. Don't try to tell me to be otherwise. Right. 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 So I think that's the case. So oh. would you, do you have other questions about the book? Oh, I have a whole bunch, but I probably should, should hold back and let, I, I was really struck too about how the civil war you portray through maps is a, is just a vast refugee experience for everybody. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, and a hundred thousand former slaves, we, we now are guessing, probably died in those contraband camps. Right. But then there's all the rural white Southerners and, and but it's a, it's a ref, it's the first massive refugee experience, at least in the history of North America. And they're flooding into Richmond too. Oh yeah. 
So yeah. the thing is that they fled into places that are going to be safe, like Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> and, but I mean, that's a part of it. <laughs> I, I would say this, David, and this is kind of a bridge maybe to some of the other things that we can talk sure, about. Sure, sure. I told you before that I, I got into social history in the 1970s because I wanted to write a democratic history mm -hmm. yeah. that included as many people as possible. These appearances in the census are the most democratic evidence we have, right? right? Even if you never wrote another word, people's lives are represented in where they lived and where they moved. This mm. is the only freedom that a lot of people had in, in their lives was yeah. to move or the very embodiment of their unfreedom is to be moved, to separate from their families and so forth. So yeah. I think that, you know, the, uh, ironically to do a kind of electronic history I'm doing it because it allows us to include as many people as possible. And sure. that's the reason I want to show some of the other maps uh, of other projects, if that's okay. Oh, let's do it. Let's do it. And then we'll get to Q&A here in a few minutes. And uh, so hold on out there, everybody. I see the Q&A is full of 13 questions already. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. so, so you'll recognize this, right? That's what we just looked at. But this is from the Digital Scholarship yeah. Lab at the University of Richmond. Wow. And I want people to look at this for other things. This is our most popular uh, map. This is mapping of redlining. And it's of every, mm. uh, every, uh, every city with redlining. It's been used really all over the world. I'm, I'm not going to allow it to actually take me to Richmond right now. But it takes you in. Well, I will. It, it will take you into the city and show you all the areas that are redlined, the descriptions that people use. You know, as you do it, 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 it you can take it to the description of that place, right? Uh, then we have, they've made another map of, of um, social vulnerability and the legacy of redlining. So if we choose, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and choose one I know. Uh, it, it, it maps those redlining maps, and you can see it's dynamic on the city today, uh, the social vulnerability score. And you can see how the effect of redlining is enduring. And so wherever you're teaching across the United States, uh, our friends have made these incredible maps. The New York Times has picked these up and used them to talk about the effects of climate change in cities today. Uh, I sh this is electing the House of Representatives, which is uh, every election uh, in the United States from 1840 uh, wow. to the present. And you can go to any, this is the district that I'm from. I was talking about being, and you can see it shows you across its entire history, flip Democratic, Republican, its votes. So you could, those of teachers can say, let's go to our district and see how we voted a hundred years ago. That's an amazing amount of <laughs> evidence in, in that. Um, and you can also, uh, this is one of my favorites, you know, when, when we imagined uh, this, this is called American Panorama. It's a digital atlas of American history. Mm. And you can click on any county uh, in America. Let's go in any year. Let's go to 1970 and let's go to sort of, uh, that's uh, Prince George's, Maryland. Mm. Uh, and you see it sends out tendrils to wherever in the world that people came from. Oh and my you God. Can watch it change over time. And you see it specifies in the histogram on the right, the origins of people. So look at that. So that, that's, you know, Maryland, El Salvador, Jamaica, Philippines. Then you can click on say El Salvador and it will show you uh, the yeah. uh, places in the United States where people from El Salvador move. Wow. Isn't that cool? And that so what, cool. I, what I say about this is that I want every middle school student in America to be able to see themselves in American history, right? Oh, I want you to be oh. able to go to your county. And That's be beautiful, Ed. Isn't it? I'm tempted to ask you to look up my county in Flint, Michigan, but no. Uh, you're going to have to do that later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, and this was the original uh, inspiration for Southern Journey. Um, and you can see, so this is... Um, um, well, this was the domestic slave trade map. That's right. That, that was the original see, map, huh? Yeah, yeah, right. But you can see, and this is useful for teaching, right? How right. In 18, so let's go to 1840s, you know, switch. You see how the counties moved down here, right? You can oh, see yeah. the counties sold the most people, for example, things yeah. like that. But yeah. it also shows you with cotton and sugar, but uh, shows you over the states as well. But you can switch over 
and it gives you the slave narratives of the people in those years who were oh. caught up in the slave trade. Wow. Let me reiterate, this is Rod Nelson, Nate Ayers, and Justin Madrin, Digital Scholarship Lab. Wow. We've made this. And so and it's all a part work. of New American History, okay? NewAmericanHistory.org. Um, and my colleague, Annie Evans, uh, who I'm sure is with us, is uh, a wonderful, gifted teacher for decades, probably not 40 years, only those of us who are as old as you and me have taught for 40 years, Dan. But, um, and has made these great learning resources for every part of American history. So this is an article she wrote today about mm -hmm. the things that our students just saw and how they can see this. But you can also, and it has maps from um, American Panorama, but it also has a project uh, called Bunk, which is named after the Henry Ford quote that right. history is more or less bunk. Right. Every day, Tony Field and his colleagues curate representations of the past in all media and then they're all linked together, right? So you can see all the different topics that are that are on here. Some of them are immediately relevant. Others are things that you know you talked before about the the uh, the devastation of the COVID crisis uh, on the reservations, right? So mm -hmm. that that, that's, that that follows your interests. So you can say, I want to see connections. I want to see the other articles. So these are other articles about American Indians burial, forgetting, or Native American culture. And it will take you through all these articles. Mm -hmm. And then your, your students can click on that and, it's, and it reboots. It starts a new set of connections. So there's 6,000 articles from, this is the conversation, uh, but there's everything from the Times and the Post. There's quite a bit of David Blight in here, uh, but there's also from you know wonderful blogs on nursing history, say, things like that that people don't know, uh, mm -hmm. that don't, don't normally see. So Ed, do you and your team do you and your team uh, run little seminars on how to use this for teachers? Yeah, we're uh, we're going to do more of that now. Uh, we're uh, we're talking to our friends at uh, Go to Lehrman uh, about ways that we can do this. But yes, we do. Annie has worked today with a, a group who did a whole week's worth of exercises on those maps. And so mm -hmm. you know, here's a way to think about it. Okay. Oh gosh, everybody's talking about impeachment. I've got to go into my US history 11th grade class tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, here are the 76 articles about mm -hmm. impeachment, right? And you can look at it. What you can do is have your students go to Bunk, find the three articles that you find most compelling about that. They can do it on their phones. And then at mm -hmm. the bottom, they can save their collection of articles and it be sent to the teacher. So the mm -hmm. teacher comes in and says, oh, okay, well, 14 of you chose this article about impeachment is most revealing. Why did you think that was? So you can see what we're trying to do is to draw connections between uh, current events and history. This is what I call ambient history, David. You ambient. Know, ambient. Ambient, right? It's the history that's around. Because, you know, kids think the history is the stuff in the textbook. But yeah. it's being sold to you in every form of, you see cartoons here, Westerns, games, all these kinds of things. Um, and you see this would connect back to these maps that I showed before, uh, right. it's a video. Now, the other thing that we're getting, people may remember Backstory, uh, on which you've made star appearances in the past, our, uh, our podcast, we're getting ready to integrate all 12 years of Backstory into new American history oh. so, that, so that people can, uh, uh, all the different segments, you'll be able to search it. And you'll say, I'd like to have an eight minute segment. Wow. For example, if I could just hear David Blight talk about Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the Fourth of July speech. It's really one of my favorite moments that I had on 12 Years on Backstory. You'll be able to find that. So if people come to New American History and go to Explore, you can explore by era, mm. or you can uh, explore by location or by these additions. So oh, this has got to be so valuable right now when so many people are still teaching remote. My God. Well, that's the idea. We, I, I, we obviously didn't make it uh, knowing that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I want any design this, you can choose reading level, grade mm -hmm. level, what kind of thinking, inquiry, critical thinking, 
literacy, collaboration. And then Annie has made all of these, so she's made uh, resources about Southern Journey that we were just talking about, right? But she's right. also made resources about inaugurations of the 20th Amendment. You can see the student version, but this is the teacher version. And it shows you links to Bunk, to Backstory, to the maps we just saw in American Panorama, and then to the other learning resources. And Annie has made all of these, so you go to any of them, and they are uh, recognized that what standards they would fill, if you need to do that, and how they connect. Yeah. So this is what we're doing now, David, if taking advantage of the digital moment, which has seemed so corrosive in our time. And we imagined it as an enhancement of in-person yeah. learning, but it certainly does work very well for Zoom. So that's a cool You know, uh, uh, we got a lot of questions in the Q and A. Okay, I'm I ready. Suspect, I suspect some are from teachers and some of them are about your techniques of creating this, for example, uh, Kenneth Hawkins asks, how were you able to pinpoint geographic origins and destinations at nearly the sub-county level? Did you map enumeration districts to their modern coordinates? I don't quite understand that. But That's a great you, question. How did you get to that level is what he's asking. Yeah, well, this is where Justin and Nate devised this method for me. So if you, you saw those maps, I'll, I'll go back. I think it's, this is a a, a good question. So I, I think it's worth talking about. Let me just show you. Uh, you remember what they look like, but let, let's let one of them come back. Yeah. Takes a little while to come back into focus. We, the major problem this was trying to uh, fix was let's try and get one that would just so I can show it real quickly. Uh, is county boundary changes. Okay. So uh -huh. Since those counties didn't exist from, from 1840 when the population's moving in, right? The counties are constantly changing. So my friends developed this thing called hex bins, which there we go. So you can see that they are merging two counties, right? And then the computer generates, uh, sort of extrapolates where the population was in one county and the other, then blends them together so we can see what the concentration is. So all these are algorithms based on county population data. But by breaking, getting rid of the county boundaries, we give a much more fluid uh, representation of it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, basically, my short answer would be magic. <laughs> but, <laughs> but here's the thing. All this data we've always had. Yeah. This, this is visualizing numbers that we already possessed, but yeah. that we, but we're we're taking it out of its boxes and letting yeah, it. Yeah, right. Okay. okay. Well, here's another uh, kind of micro question, but okay. it's interesting. Uh, Ken Habib wants to know: uh, Did you get down to the le specific level of ethnicities? That, for example, the Scotch Irish culture in the South, which uh, Ken believes is the origin of the South's political class. We, were you able to get down to that level or did you? No, it's interesting. So that's did my- you need to, I don't know. Well, in some ways I would say this, emphasizing the mobility of the South dissolves a little bit of that ethnic determinism. Uh -huh. Now, yeah. I am Scots-Irish, which yeah. means you don't really want to cross me, right? <laughs> yeah. And you getting out swords and weird flags and stuff. Yeah, and, I mean, and so my family. You beat actually, on stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my family embodies what people think of. So we grew up here from the 1830s. Yeah. As I point out, we had all of America that we could move to. We chose the next to the highest mountain in the east, where there's not a single, there's not a piece of flat land the size of my office here. Uh, <laughs> and then my mom and dad moved exactly an hour north to a little industrial city of Kingsport, Tennessee. Uh -huh. So I would seem to be as hillbilly as you can get, you know, yeah. Scots Irish and all this. But the fact is, is that the Scots Irish are one of the dominant ethnicities across the North as well. Uh, right, so right. I, right. I guess I would generally say a, a bias I have uh -huh. is putting the South into motion is to cut against any Right. Okay. Fixed definition. So the only determinism, the only determinism you're willing to entertain is movement. 
<laughs> and even that is, what's the determinist? I think you got it earlier before. Yeah. One of the things I had to really learn about was, okay, you are going to move across. You're going to leave Virginia, as all these mm -hmm. people did. Yeah. And you're going to go there. What are you looking for? Mm -hmm. Well, you're looking for a piece of land that has a water supply. You have mm -hmm. a spring. Mm -hmm. You're looking for a place that's got a wood lot so you can actually feed your, yourself. Mm -hmm. You're looking for a place, you probably, if you're poor, you're not going to be able to get close to a river, right? So you're, going to, you're looking for a place where you can support, where your hogs and cattle yeah. can feed themselves. And so, you know, go, go to the spirit of Ken's question. If we turn up the magnification by using lots of social uh, community studies, you know, the people have written in the 70s and right. 80s, you can see that on the macro level, that farmers are making very rational decisions about right. where they're going to move. And so they are moving to places where they can, with no money, make a farm until they can raise money uh, to support themselves. So it's not determinism, but it is people being aware of what they're doing, yeah. looking for opportunity. Let me go back to one more spirit of Ken's question. You do see people from the upper south moving across the rich land of the Cumberland Plateau, the rich mm -hmm. land of the Mississippi Delta into Arkansas, into more hills. <laughs> you know? And people look at that and say, well, that's the Scotch Irish for you. you know, they're looking for some place to make a moonshine or something, right? What it means is that you know how to farm that land, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And so people, all migration is east to west. There's very little migration of Virginians to the deep south. That's mainly uh -huh. South Carolina and Georgia that are uh -huh. populating Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas. Uh -huh. More people from Virginia are going to Ohio and Illinois and Indiana. Oh, yeah. Thousands. They're going to the south. Yeah. Thousands. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which means they may be fleeing slavery. Yeah. You know, in the way that Abraham Lincoln's family did. Yeah. Okay, that's a long answer about the Scots Irish. What else okay. you got? <laughs> I thought that might happen. Well, our old friend Lois McMillan, who is Gilder Lehrman Institute's legendary seminar director. Hello, Lois. She's asked an interesting question here. Uh, does the black population migration reflect increased violence at certain times in certain areas? And could you could you could you factor that in, I guess, the questions of violence breaking out at different times, lynchings? This is the old idea, you know, a lynching would cause migration and so on. Yeah, my own argument, which How I- How the maps show any of that? I don't know. Well, uh, my own argument is, uh, I'm gonna show you, if you- So that Nate made of the boll weevil shows you the spread of the boll weevil, right? Uh -huh. That it was much worse in many ways later in Georgia because of the condition of the land. Yeah. So, so here is the peak of lynching. So this is black population change, 1890 to 1900. Right. The clearest statistical correlation that I can find, and I have this in Promise of the New South, uh -huh. areas where there's relatively low white population, but rapid increase in black population. Uh -huh. Because why are they moving there? I told you before about sharecropping, but they're also moving to lumbering and timbering, turpentining, phosphate yeah. mining. And it's those places and coal mining, they're moving into Appalachia. So peak of lynching is not where most black people live, but it is where black people are moving. So Lois is, is right. My own belief is, is that the, the clearest indicator of this is black ambition. Uh -huh. you know? So imagine you're a 20 year old guy, you hear that there's a lumber camp hiring, right? And so you and your two friends have to walk or catch a train to the yeah. lumber camp. Yeah. You're remarkably vulnerable to be charged of lynching because you're strange, neither the black nor white community knows, knows you. Uh -huh. uh, and so the vulnerability, so that's my own theory. Well, I think you've uh, you've actually helped here with one or two more questions we okay. have. Uh, Vaughn Danvers has asked something similar. Okay. He says uh, he's always understood black migration from the South as a direct response to Jim Crow laws and domestic terrorism. And he even mentions a, a famous piece by Langston Hughes called One Way Ticket. 
So what you're trying to, to show though, that there, there are many causes, there, there's no mono cause of this. There are many causes of movement. Yeah, I mean, as I started reading about demography, you know, I think one of the oldest models in demography is push pull, right? Yeah, yeah. People yeah. at the time, we're talking about this, black journalists, and it's and I have good quotes in the book actually of saying, you don't have to look far to see why we're leaving the South. Yeah. Right? But for the first time, we were allowed to be pulled. You wait until World War I stops immigration from Europe. You'd rather hire non-English speaking people from Europe than to hire fifth generation black people from the South, right? Until yeah. you have no choice and then you do. So here's what I would say. I believe that there's probably not a likely correlation between the amount of violence and injustice and the amount of out migration because there was nowhere for black people to go yeah. at the time during reconstruction, the new South, when it was great. I would say probably that we do know this. Suddenly, as soon as the great migration begins, white landowners and employers start asking people they just mistreated devilishly for 20 years not to leave. If you'll stay, I'll build a school for your children. Yeah. If you'll stay, I'll let you have another 20 acres to share a crop. Right. And so I never want to underestimate the role of violence and disfranchisement and segregation. And it's touching to read what it's like to move to a place in Chicago or Detroit that doesn't have those things, even though they, of course, don't find nirvana there either. Yeah. So I think that I do believe that Black people and white people and immigrant people are moving mainly to improve the lives of themselves and their families. Now, that sounds so obvious, yeah. but what it means is that Black people are aware of where opportunity lies, and they're willing to risk so much to get it. Yeah. And so I think that's the, what's the common, common denominator here. As early as the Civil War itself, you talked about the refugee camps. Yeah. yeah. The first moment Black people are making their own lives. That's what these maps show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, there are a couple of questions about did did you did you do mapping of migrations to California? And uh, I don't I don't know how much you did. I don't remember now. Yes. Uh, if so, if we look at the maps of the 20th century, uh, yeah. this will move. Uh, let's see. But so yes. Uh, all, all the maps of uh, 20th century on have maps of, of that. What you'll see if, if we go to, well, let's go back to uh, black population change. So you can certainly see South, uh, Southern California, right? Yeah. You can start seeing Los Angeles growing 1940s and 50s, and you can see San Francisco. Uh, so yes, it shows all the places. And you can also see here in the 1950s, black people moving to Denver. Uh -huh. You start seeing, you know, yeah. uh, Minneapolis, so we know yeah. recent events there, right? So yeah. I think that, uh, now, now why don't we do that before the war, before the Civil War? It's because black people could not leave. Yeah. So the, the, and, and so on the same scale that we would have, you would not see any movement. Um, but uh, you certainly see lots of movement to California of black and white people. I mean, let, let's look down at white, look at the difference there, white population change in, right. uh, now, what this is, though, this doesn't mean at this point that they're moving from the South. That's just population growth in California. Right. James Gregory has written a great book. It's probably the, the book that's most like th this one that I drew on uh -huh. about uh, migration in the 20th century. Um, and uh, he does trace uh, by state. And it turns out that far more white people are leaving the South throughout the 20th century than black people and all the way into the 1970s. Uh -huh. Okay? Right. You know, uh, since you brought up James Gregory and other books and you're relying on so much work here to create all of this project, I, I wanna take you back to a mention you have in the book of Carter Woodson's book. First book, this is the great black historian who uh, was right, what, uh, born in Virginia, ended up working in coal mines in West Virginia gets out of there, what, the, the second black PhD at Harvard, I think after Du Bois, 
But he, his first book was called A Century of Negro Migration, and it's published as early as 1918. Yeah. So already then, he, he saw this. Of course, his, his techniques uh, clearly were much more limited, but, but talk about that book a little. And then other works that you, you know, honestly, don't give us a historiographical essay, but, yeah. but the stuff you're drawing off here to, to synthesize this amazing story. Well, that particular book was revelatory to me because I, I just said uh, that I focused so much on the forced migration of black people inside the South during slavery, right? Right. And, so I, but, and as you know, people are emphasizing now that the number of people who could actually escape slavery in the Underground Railroad was probably just a few thousand people a year, right? Yeah. And so that, again, that's something I, you'd think from our textbooks that <laughs> it's like the Great Migration, right? Uh, but it, it's not. But so I was wondering, well, how many uh, people who either became free uh, mm -hmm. were able to migrate in the South? And Woodson is showing that in all the, what we now think of as the Midwest, mm -hmm. that black people were moving there all along, often relatively small populations, probably for self-preservation. If you're too large a concentration, you're making yourself vulnerable, ironically. So I think my, my memory is it's like 80,000 uh, African-American people are moving into the Midwest. And so I went back and rewrote that part to point out that, you know, there's a half million free black people in America in, in 1860 and right. that people leaving Virginia. So that same theme of self-determination mm -hmm. is even under slavery. Mm -hmm. and that people were venturing into really scary places like heavily white Illinois or Indiana yeah. Yeah. and or Minnesota as black people to make families. So I think in some ways what that reminded me is that Woodson being closer to it mm. uh, remembered it, but our stories about American history have made us forget it. Yeah. So, so yeah. That's, that's, I particularly remember that. Um, I'd say that the other things that I, I, I've never written about the South after World War II before. Oh, yeah, that's new for you. That's yeah, new. and so actually, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm really grateful to Jim Cobb and, and uh, Gavin Wright both wrote blurbs because I wrote them and said, what I believe is what I can see is that this big turnaround, mm -hmm. it seems to me that the civil rights movement liberates the South to actually flourish. Yeah. And that you would, oh, yeah. for the first time, actually have international corporations willing to set up their headquarters in Atlanta or because they get rid of segregation. So when I'm out on the hustings, I'll say, Dr. King did more for economic development of the South than every chamber of commerce ever been in. <laughs> and it's really well, and he cut deals with the Birmingham uh, business titan. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, the thing is, and I, I was thinking the other day too, we, I was talking to some friends about the you know, NFL. And they were asking, what was my team growing up? And I said, well, there wasn't an NFL team for many hundreds of miles. Right. When I was growing up in the 50s and 60s in, in Tennessee, um, or a baseball team either, because we just yeah. now lost Henry Aaron, right? And remembering, I actually, he features in, in uh, Southern Journey as a critical moment when the South turns. Yeah. And he says, I'm from the South. I don't want to live there. But yeah. once he goes and... Yeah other black people follow. So this is, the, this is the South in which Henry Aaron's moving to Atlanta. Right. This is when he hits his home runs. 1974, right. I just made that up on the fly. I thought that was pretty good. That's pretty uh, quick, man. I got yeah. another question here from a teacher yeah. in, in Nashville, your yeah. state. Uh, it's Adam Knight. He says, I asked my students how they got to Nashville <laughs> in an assignment. And he says, all of their answers dealt with economic issues. So are you saying that movement of people is almost always economically related? Now, that may have an obvious answer, but it's interesting that the kids all told him, well, this job or that job for my parents, probably. Yes, but you'll notice how I translated that. Yeah, yeah. Families looking to create opportunities. So it's economic. You know, yeah. I guess I'm so weary of people talking about the Civil War was economic. It was just economics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I know. That's, that's... <laughs> and so, in this that, territory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But in this case, my mom and dad moved to work in two factories in, in 
East Tennessee. Right. Uh, and so that was economic. But yeah. did they also know that there were going to be opportunities for their kids in the schools? Yeah. Because the town that we moved to is East McCodack was there. And mm. so all the people from Rochester moved there mm. and they were willing to invest in public schools. And so uh, Kingsport, Tennessee, actually, it, along with Oak Ridge, Tennessee, created in World War II for the bombs, mm. were kind of like these two prosperous small cities in, in Appalachia that mm. would do that. So it is economics, but I think if we think of it instead in terms of what was the story in their heads? Yeah. It's so that my family has a chance. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what I think. So the answer is yes, but yeah. I think, you know, we yeah. all know now how much words matter. And ironically, I think economics is a word that is kind of flattening. It is, it is. It's, it says everything and nothing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one final big question, Ed, if I can here. I mean, you've studied this region all of your life. Um, we we are always, in fact, you use the term paradoxes in your book, the paradoxes of the South, the contradictions of the South. And there's no bigger one now than the return migrations to the South, which is what your third chapter is all about. And a kind of new politics that has evolved, not entirely by any means, but now Texas is at least almost purple. Uh, Florida keeps going back and forth. But is there a sense in which the South, writ large, um, provides a lot of hope uh, in this rather bleak political uh, time we've been living through? And I'm not just talking about the Trump years. I'm talking about the last 20, 30, 40 years of the, of the kind of conservatism that has evolved in this country that is deeply rooted in the South, and we all Many of us remember, you know, Reagan started his campaign in Mississippi and so on and so forth. But is there a sense in which this changing, moving, mobile South uh, may be what will ultimately, I mean, the, 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 we never get to Shangri-La and only fools think we do. But is there, is there really a hopeful story here that, that this new, 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 new South may be the new, new, new United States? If we think about where the different currents might merge to change yeah. American politics, I think the South is that. So we've yeah. seen what's the deepest current of all. It's the yeah. loyalty of African Americans in the South to the Democratic Party yeah. that gave them a chance in the New Deal and in the civil rights struggle, right? Yeah. So 87, 90%. Black people who are most of whom still live in the South, by the way, uh, yeah. uh, laid the foundations, sort of kept the democratic faith, right? Now <clears throat> you see the booming cities, which actually, you know, back in Promise of the New South, I, I showed how that actually began yeah. in the 1880s, right? The, the, and along the railroads. And ever since then, the South has been a rapidly in urbanizing place. Oh, yeah. And what goes along with that is, like my folks made it possible for me to go to the University of Tennessee, mm -hmm. cost virtually nothing, right? Yeah. To get a college education. And most of my friends went back home and with the college education, we know the difference that makes in party identity as well. Mm -hmm. And you've seen the patterns of migration not of immigrants. Now that's interesting because we saw in the last election, that's by no means determined that either people from Asia or people from Latin America are gonna vote for the Democrats. But what it does mean is that the communities are far more diverse, that people are meeting people unlike themselves uh, yeah. and learning that they are like themselves <laughs> when you actually get a chance to meet them, right? And so if you think about the substrata, really, of black voting and residents in the South, yeah. joined with the uh, suburbanization of the black population, join with the suburbanization of the white population, join with the suburbanization of the immigrant population, right. you can see how I believe you're right. Now, I'm, I've lived in Virginia since 1980. You mm -hmm. now know we have two Democratic senators and a Democratic governor and who's changing things very rapidly on all the Confederate monuments and things. That's another talk, not for tonight. Um, 
And um, so we've already that seen- That one another time. <laughs> exactly. But we see Virginia changing. I think Georgia's next. I think it will not be long until North Carolina does that. Mm. Uh, ironically, you know, it's kind of funny. People don't want to include Florida in the South unless they do. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, you yeah. Know, if it's different, well, it's not really the South, but unless yeah. it does something you don't like, then yeah, let's call it the South, right? Texas is the same way. Northern Florida has always been the South. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. So to answer your question, I would say that if the South is going to change, and by changing, change America, it's going to be migration that changes it. Yeah. Right? I think that's, the, that's, that's a big takeaway of your book. Frankly, really and that the roots of, and the South has never stood still. Yeah. Okay, from the, the actual creation of it in 1790. Moving on, as soon as we have a, a census, you may say, "Why start in 1790?" It's the first time we have these numbers, right? Yeah. To yeah. the present, I do believe that the only constant of Southern history is change. Yeah, is population yeah. movement, yeah. which is a weird argument. But I, I believe that the, the maps let us see that. Oh, it's less and less weird, though. I mean, I, I mean, it, it, I, when I think about the textbook I've been part of now for 25 years and more, uh, we, we've been saying this, at least in our textbook, all along. You know, the South is, never has been a static thing. Uh, of course, actually, New England was more static in some ways over longer periods of time than the South ever was. But that's another, that's another matter. Um, well, listen, we've already run up to 8.30, Ed, um, and we still have a big audience out there. there. There were a couple other questions flying around, but I think I'll, I'll leave them be. I just want to say that this has been quite a, uh, a treat uh, to have you here, an honor to have you, and to hear you work with this material and reflect on it, which you've had so much to do with creating along with your team. And I hope out there we've we've reached a, a lot of teachers tonight who can, uh, and we'll reach even more when we put this out as a, as a video, because this is such a teachable project, not just the book, but the website and the New American History website as well. So Ed, thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you for joining me and us. And, uh, you know, it, it was a thrill to, to be here. And to, I, I had three pages of notes and questions. I don't even need to ask any more questions. I, I think I only asked you two questions and you just took off. Which well, I gave you enough answers for several. No, that, that was great, Ed. But so, I, uh, I, I wanted yeah. to call people's attention to one thing that I didn't, that I forgot. Sure. An amazing new podcast series. Oh, yeah. By Kadada Williams that tells the story of emancipation. Oh, wow. Voices of the people who are making themselves free. Uh, I'm executive producer on it, uh, yeah. but Kadada and a remarkable team, is, it's great. And it starts um, soon. So you can go on um, the New American History and see or seizingfreedom.com. It's going to be dynamite. People are going to love it. So oh, I know you said goodbye to me. That was like the. Oh, no, no, no. Well, I'm not. I'm saying goodbye to everybody here. I just want to say to all of our audience, thanks for coming tonight. Stay tuned to the newsletter at the GLC. We have many more events coming up through the rest of this spring, including I'm going to do a book uh, interview talk with Alice Baumgartner on her wonderful new book on the Texas border, Mexico and the United States, which is getting a great deal of attention. Uh, and uh, there, will, there will be other, others to come. Ed Ayers, thank you again. What a treat. Thanks thank so much, my man. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank Bye. you, Ed. Take care now.